What's the literal definition of risk? Business schools use risk analysis. So, what do you mean by risk? And we need a dictionary. When you look at dictionary, this is literal. Literal definition of risk. What it says is, the definition for example, the possibility of injury, a dangerous element or factor, chance of degree or possibility of such loss, and so on. So, risk has two parts. As you look at the literal definition of risk, one part is the consequence of some kind of particular danger, hazard loss, and the other is about the probability of it, chance and consequence. Okay? And then at least just as English language concerns, when you look up the word of safe and safety, which you learned as, it's a little bit of a lube, a little circular argument that free from harm or risks, secure from danger, harm or loss, the condition of being safe and so on for all, and why we take out of it. At least when we talk about safe at least in English language, we are talking absolute something is safe, or it sounds safe.
Last month I published alongside my annual report a subject to report on the development of citizenship in schools. The report celebrates the success of some schools in implementing the citizenship curriculum. It praises those schools where they have taken and have substantial developments in the subject, and which now go a long way towards fulfilling national curriculum requirements. In the report, we are critical of schools which have not taken citizenship seriously, either through reluctance or lack of capacity to make appropriate provision in the curriculum. Citizenship is marginalized in the curriculum. And in one-fifth of schools, it is less well established in the curriculum than other subjects, and less well taught. And some critics have seized on this as a reason for wanting to step back from supporting it. Yet, the progress made to date by the more committed school suggests that the reasons for introducing citizenship are both worthwhile and can be fulfilled, given the time and resources. Indeed, those reasons are given added weight by national and global events of the past few months. While not claiming too much, citizenship can address core skills, attitudes and values that young people need to consider as they come to terms with a changing world.
Various species of Pacific salmon make a round trip from the small streams where they are born to the sea and then back to the stream of their origin where they spawn and die. This round trip is known as the salmon's run. The end of the salmon's run is the beginning of the next generation. Pacific salmon hatch in the headwaters of a stream. As fry, the fish then migrate downstream via rivers and eventually to the ocean, where they require several years to mature. While in the sea, salmon from many river systems school and feed together. When mature, the salmon form into groups of common geographic origin and migrate back toward the river they emerged from as juveniles. Is it true that they find their way home by their sense of smell? During the first stage of their return, they navigate by the position of the sun, but later, when they reach the river leading to their home stream, their keen sense of smell takes over. Just what is it they can smell? The other fish? The water flowing from each stream carries a unique scent. This scent comes from the types of plants, soil, and other components of that stream. This scent is apparently imprinted in the memory of a salmon fry before it migrates to the sea. I remember having a real shock when I was hiking once. I was looking at a waterfall, and I saw a salmon jump up, about ten feet. At first I couldn't believe my eyes, but then I saw another one do it, and then several more. It was an awesome sight. They must have an incredibly powerful instinct. The survival of their species depends on their ability to get home and reproduce. And, of course, other species depend on the survival of the salmon. Salmon provide an important link in the food chain. They spend 90% of their lives in the ocean, where they feed on plankton, shrimp, and small fish. When they make their return journey, they carry nutrients from the ocean back to the rivers and streams. Up north, where I used to live in the river valley, the eagles would gather for the salmon run every year. They'd gorge themselves on all the salmon that had just spawned. Nothing is wasted in nature. After the salmon spawn, their carcasses feed birds, mammals, and vegetation, and even their own newly hatched offspring. Avalanches are a constant threat on mountain highways. The Rogers Pass stretch of the Trans-Canada is at risk of being buried in snow from November to April every year. This is why the highway now has a sophisticated defense system. The best way, uh, it's important to control an avalanche when it's small, so a slide is set off while it's still small before it builds up into a serious danger. A team of snow technicians monitors the snowpack. They sort of read the snow and try to predict when it's likely to slide. They study data from the weather stations in the mountains. As the danger increases, they drop explosives onto test slopes to see if the snow can be made to slide. It's kind of tricky trying to decide just when the snow will slide. The weight of the snow, together with the force of gravity, is what starts an avalanche. The technicians don't want to wait till it's too late, but if they're too early, before conditions are just right, the snow won't release. When the time is right, they close the road and remove all traffic from the pass. Most closures last two to four hours. Then the army comes in. A 10-man artillery crew operates a mobile 105 millimeter howitzer, firing shells into the slopes. This sends out shock waves that trigger the avalanches. Slides are set off one by one. The technicians direct the action telling the troops where to aim the gun. Visibility can be awful. Then they have to check and see if the avalanche has released well enough. Sometimes they drive their trucks below the slide path, kind of dangerous work, and they listen to the snow come down. Sometimes, if the slide is bigger than they expected, they might have to make a speedy getaway. Number If you designed an almost perfect anti-brain learning environment, it would look something like a typical classroom. And if you were to design an almost perfect anti-brain working environment, it would look something like a typical office cubicle. Why? Because tiny proteins called BDNFs are actually created when you exercise, and these help the brain to develop. 
so exercise boosts brain power. The problem lies in the fact that we measure distance today in terms of the space between the refrigerator, the bathroom and the couch. Says Robert Hutchins, Whenever I feel like exercise, I lie down until the feeling passes. Our ancestors, on the other hand, walked an average of 12 miles a day, and hence the brain developed as a survival organ that was designed to solve problems in an unstable environment in almost constant motion. If our ancestors had lain around, well, let's just say that survival didn't favour the sedentary types. So, what are we to do? If I were an employer, I'd want the workplace environment to encourage exercise, to boost my employees' brain power. Dr. Tony Wagner believes there are seven skills that young people need to have in order for them to find and keep a good job in today's economy. But he thinks our schools are focusing too much on tests and academic performance and aren't doing enough to teach those skills. Let me give you an example. One of Wagner's seven skills is the ability to work in an international team. This is because little teamwork is carried out in one building anymore. When most global companies have a problem, they create teams of people from all over the world to solve it. And these people meet online, in virtual meeting rooms. To succeed in this kind of environment, you need to be a good communicator and understand different cultures. Teams also need good leaders, who lead by influencing others, but Wagner and the business people he interviewed say that young people today are unprepared for teamwork and leadership. Because of this, Wagner thinks that people involved in teaching and learning must rethink the way that they educate people in schools so that these young people have the skills they need to achieve a successful career in the 21st century. Good afternoon, Miss Davis. I was told by James that you wanted to see me in your office. Oh, I did. Thank you for coming, Jean. Have a seat. How are you? Is everything going fine? Yes, pretty much. What about you, Miss Davis? I haven't seen you for a while. Yes, I was away for a while. Actually, I went to Arizona and met your mother there. Didn't she tell you about it? No, she didn't, but that's great. How is she? She is fine. To me, she is still as exuberant as she was 20 years ago. You will never know how great a teacher your mother was. Anyway, how was your semester? It was fun. The teachers were nice, especially Ms. McKenna. I loved her class. Strange, I never liked math and struggled so much until I met Ms. McKenna. That's great. How was she so wonderful? She spoke softly and explained thoroughly. She answered all of the questions earnestly. I wish all my teachers were like Miss McKenna. Many of her students made that comment in the past, too. Who could have guessed that I could get an A in math? Why not? You're smart. You can get an A in any subject you want as long as you try. I believe so. I should have tried harder instead of giving up and neglecting the hard subjects.
Both the rotation of the moon and its revolution around Earth takes 27 days, 7 hours and 43 minutes to be exact. Because of this motion, the moon appears to move about 13 degrees against the stars each day, or about half of a degree per hour. If you watch the moon over the course of several hours one night, you will notice that its position among the stars will change by a few degrees. The changing position of the moon with respect to the sun leads to lunar phases. The computerized workplace can be hazardous to your health if you don't take preventative measures. Today, we'll go over what some of these hazards are, and more importantly, what can be done about them. One major complaint, maybe the biggest complaint, of people who spend time at the computer is eye strain. To help ease the strain on the eyes, the computer screen should be about two feet from your eyes. The entire screen should be in focus. The brightness and contrast should be adjusted for best readability. A good way to relieve eye strain is to look away from the screen frequently. Focus your eyes on objects that are far away, like something outside, the building across the street or the tree in the park. The word science comes from a Latin verb meaning to know. Science is a way of knowing. It emerges from our curiosity about ourselves and our world. Striving to understand is one of our basic drives. Who are scientists? Scientists are people who ask questions about nature and who believe that these questions can be answered. Scientists are explorers who are passionate about
these studies that are going on at the moment, but the latest one which is, I find really exciting is working with family carers of people living with dementia. And we're actually showing the family carers how to use music in really strategic ways to support the care of the person that they're looking after. But we're also interested in preserving the relationship between the carer and the person that they're caring for, because one of the challenges for carers is that when they're caring for someone and that person starts to forget who they are and stops recognizing them, the person with dementia doesn't give anything back. So, using music in a way that helps to bring that person to the present. It's been interesting because in the last week or so, there's been quite a bit of media kerfuffle about the topic of indigenous science. What is indigenous science? How does it relate to Western science? Can we even put them on the same level? Is it political correctness gone mad? Am I just another social justice warrior interested in pushing a culture war, you know? Funny for a white American astrophysicist to be accused of that. And the future, of course, lies somewhere in between those. It's not like it's black and white or shades of grey. But putting these extreme scenarios helps us tell the story and imagine what the futures are. And the four scenarios that we did in this study. I'm going to summarize briefly just because of time. The first one is something called the global orchestration. Global orchestration, I would summarize this word dominated by the United Nations. So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy, you need very advanced techniques for electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host and us as human beings are made up of lots of different cell types and we are interested in understanding at the molecular level. How that virus infects the liver and why does it infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart or it doesn't infect other tissues. Finally, we take a look at how to mix an unmixed liquid at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together just as easily as it brought them together, it can also separate them out again. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative which involves using high energy centrifuges. The digital revolution has changed the way we read. The digital revolution has changed the way we read.
the railway makes long-distance travel possible for everyone. The railway makes long-distance travel possible for everyone. Teaching assistants will receive a monthly stipend for housing. Teaching assistants will receive a monthly stipend.